Hello and welcome to the Sandeep Roy show on Express Audio. The Sandeep Roy show. June is celebrated as Pride Month internationally, and since the 2018 verdict that read down section 377, Pride Month has come to India with a rainbow vengeance. Pride issues of magazines, corporate diversity workshops and pride melas and pride film screenings are all par for the course. But this year also marks a decade of another very important verdict. In 2014, the Supreme Court ruled on a writ filed by the National Legal Services Authority on Nalsa that the government both at the state and the center must grant transgenders full recognition in the eyes of the law. Newspaper headlines the next day said Indian courts recognize third gender. In many ways, that verdict helped pave the way for the 377 verdict. But 10 years on, how much of the promise of that verdict has been realized in practice for the transgender community? Grace Banu is India's first transgender engineer and a Dalit and transgender rights activist and founded the Trans Rights Now Collective. Grace Banu, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's been 10 years since the Nalsa judgment. I was curious uh, personally what difference has it made to you? Uh I think it's more than 10 years. A few states are implementing that Nalsa judgment, but most of the states they don't even start to you know sensitize the institutions. It should be a government institution or private institution. and the public space like police corps so that's awareness they did in too and even though a uh, nalsa judgment said all the state government should create a policy to create protection for the trans community people but that is not happened yet and very few states are creating a transgender welfare board and some states are creating a trans cells and now they are providing the welfare measures they are doing is showing the transgender id card focusing on the welfare schemes like a skill development courses like that but they are not focusing on the rights based issues like education rights empowerment rights participating in the political rights so so many states are doesn't have a reservation of rights except karnataka government and all other states are like a, you know they are announcing lot of welfare schemes welfare messages but welfare messages is different and the rights is completely different how is your state tamil nadu doing and tamil nadu it's better than other states because uh, from the tamil nadu states we are having long history of trans histories in the sense from 2008 onwards our, our dr kalanjor created a transgender welfare board and uh, we got our water rights and uh, for the first time in india last year tnbsc a group four level examination is happened 154 trans persons are participated that examination so that's huge so compare with other states tamil nadu is far better but i should say they are also focusing on the welfare measures they are not even focusing on the rights based issues so that should be happen we have been demanding so many years like we filed a lot of petition in the madras high court and now the government came up with the decision yeah we are planning to provide the Arizona reservation for the trans people. They put trans people in the MBC category from 2018 onwards. So now recently they removed that government order. But in between those all the years, like almost 10 years, comparatively Tamil Nadu, we have only nine transgender persons who are working in the government sector. Wow. Karnataka government provide the reservation after they provide the reservation rights. Approximately six trans persons got the government job. 10 years nine trans persons but within 2 years six trans persons that is not an equality uh, grace so you talked about you know what the government is doing or not doing but uh, personally for you would your life be different now if the nalsa judgment had not happened um no hmm. i should say because after the nalsa judgment the constitution secured the trans people lives so after the nalsa judgment only all the trans persons slowly getting their rights after nalsa judgment transgender protection bill was introduced and the private member bill was introduced 
by uh, Tirchi Shiva and uh, now the Transgender Persons Protection Act was formed and then also clarification is also clearly said the so lot of legal constitutions constituently we got the our rights so that's more important but even uh, if we don't have an alpha judgment still we have to be like struggle a lot to enter into the equality space but as we found out i think it was the last year or something where there was that case in assam right where these uh, transgender people were i think trying to file an fir in a police station and they were asked to strip by the police officers and that caused a huge uproar and then when people went it turned out that police stations that they'd never even heard of the nalsa judgment so yeah yeah but obviously uh, till now the police stations in the rural area they don't even know what is nalsa and what is transgender persons protection act uh, in tamil nadu so many training we are giving to the police cops but even though the rural area police cops they don't know how to handle trans persons so we also faced the same kind of situation when your trans women was brutally attacked by their own family mm. so we went to file the fir in the police station and they said no 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 they are not ready to take a complaint and we fought with them we have an also judgment we have a transgender protection act why don't you file so they said we don't know we don't aware about that do you remember when where you were when the nalsa judgment happened and what your reaction was that day uh i was super happy with the other all the things but i was little upset regarding the reservational rights you know they said uh, like uh, socially economically backward uh, section so that point i don't agree with that because why not putting all the trans people in one category that is not good and from that point onwards we are struggling a lot to get the government job except that point all others are very good and give trans people as a fellow human we should be give the human rights to everybody right. so after the nalsa judgment only that happened so then after that uh, we were talking about the transgender protection bill and act when the government first came out with the bill in 2016 that led to a lot of protests what were some of the main problems with it in your view so the transgender persons bill doesn't have a clarity about their identity they said partially male nor partially female those kind of problematic words they describe uh, the gender identity so that's we strongly oppose and it doesn't have a education rights it doesn't have a employment rights it doesn't have a reservation rights so that's it's against in also verdict so that's why we started the protest and we have been demanding lot of things medical care access and uh, uh, it doesn't talk about the punishment all the punishment it's only 6 months to 2 years and what about the if a trans person getting rape what about the trans persons who was killed by their own family i don't know that's happening now even though in tamil nadu we have various uh, cases um, 18 year old trans kid who was killed by her own mother but after 15 days she got bail and the same thing has happened a uh, 19 year old trans kid who was killed by their own brother and a uh, elderly trans woman who's from coimbatore district who's a entrepreneur who was killed by a cis man and after 15 days this all the people got the bail and uh, still now all the deaths doesn't get a uh, justice parliamentarians gave lot of recommendations and the community people also gave a lot of uh, recommendations but uh, they took only few recommendations and now it came up with that which of the recommendations did they take i remember one of the areas of protest was how do you determine if someone is transgender and uh, in the initial proposal it, they had proposed to set up a uh, sort of a committee at every district or something who would testify and that led to a lot of protest where people said are we going to have to go in front of this committee and strip or you know to prove this were things like that removed as a result of the protest Oh yeah, and even though it's there in the sense they are saying uh, the self identification. Now, so the major uh, thing is self identification, but they removed that and they said uh, they didn't say about uh, self identification. They said uh, we should go to the medical examinations, and uh, that point is uh, removed, and they put the self identification. But even though if a trans person wants to change uh, their male or female identity, 
So we should be submit a lot of uh, medical documents for the identity card. So that's okay. I mean, they got those kind of points and the laser therapy, medical care. So a lot of points they took. And the center also set up a national council for transgender persons. Was that not a positive move? Oh, the council, we were demanding, we need a commission for the trans people, trans welfare commission. But the council, it's like a transgender welfare board. They are only providing the transgender ID card, shelter, and that's it. And initially, all the national council members are upper caste, Savarna community people, but people like uh, Dalit and Adivasi background, they don't have uh, an opportunity to participate in that council. And after this bill became an act, you and some other activists filed a writ petition before the Supreme Court seeking certain sections of the act to be declared as unconstitutional. What were those sections? Why did you think they were unconstitutional? In the sense, uh, it doesn't talk about reservation rights. And uh, as I said, if a trans person got a domestic violence, and this act it won't protect the trans persons. And so many youngsters we are losing. And uh, we got our data, particularly in Tamil Nadu, uh, the last year, November, one year data, 33 trans persons are killed by their own family. And few people are committed suicide. And only two people are above 30. All others are below 30. In the sense, the future generation we are losing, you know, the act should be more strong and it doesn't talk about the reservation rights, education, employment, all the things we need. And it's against the NASA judgment. It's against the social justice. It's against the equality. So what's the status of that writ petition right now? Uh, right now, government said we are doing a lot of advocacy with the various state governments. That's it. But they don't even talk about and about the reservation rights. They didn't take any action, any decision also. You know, Grace, as you were talking, I was thinking that uh, all the headlines always refer to you as this first transgender engineer and all of these things. But as a result of this activism, you've had to spend so much time in court dealing, filing writ petitions, doing this. You're practically a lawyer by now. But I was wondering how trans friendly is the court system? The court, uh, it's like uh, initially when we had a I mean, I'm talking about 2012. We have been in the courtroom more than a decade. <laughs> every case is like uh, super difficult because every judge has a different kind of thoughts and uh, different kind of, uh, you know, drawback also we face. In the sense, not all the lawyers are uh, transparently, I mean, before uh, 2012 and after the NALSA judgment and slowly all the lawyers are getting education about the trans people rights. We have trans friendly lawyers, but still in the courtroom also, we are facing transphobia and casteism. So that's uh, a lot of difficult to do the legal battle within the courtroom. And all of this, as you say, when you're talking about reservations and all, things like that, all of this needs data. You have to prove that, you know, this is a community that needs reservations. Uh, that, so what kind of hard data actually does exist about the transgender community and what kind of data do we need? Um, yeah, thank you. So for me, it's like uh, before the data, this is a democratic country and this world and this earth is for everybody who are, you know, have the rights to live in this world. So the government should have the responsibility to protect each and individual person's rights. So being a each and individual person, we should give all the rights to them. So denial of the individual person rights, it's not a constitution, it's not a social justice, it's not an equality. So coming up to the data, so when we say uh, the trans people data that was taken in uh, 2011, after that, the government didn't collect any data. So as you know, after the 2014 NALSA judgment, after that only, we got a lot of visibility spaces and nowadays we are seeing a lot of trans people are coming to the mainstream space and they are proudly say it's, uh, express their identity and everything. So this is the time the government should be start the data. And as a lot of people are uh, doing like a caste census data, 
So I hope they will do the caste census data along with the gender uh, census also. And now that this bill has been passed and it was passed right after COVID, taking some advantage of the pandemic to push this through, is it fair to say that the bill seems to have split the transgender community somewhat between those who supported the bill more or less and those who remain opposed to it? Oh, yeah. Because uh, they used the pandemic situation to pass that bill, even though a lot of suggestions, uh, member of parliamentarians and the parliament standing committee members and the NALSA verdict, NALSA clarifications, everything we submitted in front of the parliamentarians, but they didn't even care about the community recommendations, parliamentarians' recommendations, parliament standing committee recommendations and the NALSA a clarification also they didn't take very seriously. So they took the advantage of the pandemic and they passed. But in classic divide and rule kind of strategy, are you also having to fight some people within the community who they say like, okay, this bill is good enough for now. Why are you causing more trouble? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, the people who are supporting the government and they will like always say, it's like, no, 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 this is enough. But this is not enough. How trans persons in the rural area who are dying every day and this act doesn't protect those kind of children, how it's going to be enough? So that is not enough. So with the constitutions, we are fighting with the government to amendment that act. But I guess it must be harder, I would imagine, when you have to fight and oppose people within your own transgender community about your rights than fighting with the government, right? Yeah, but uh, when we say like uh, within the community, not all the people are like politically educated and they don't know. I mean, every day our, my community people are doing backing and sex work. Each and every one is going to save their livelihood. So we don't expect from those kind of community should have the political awareness. I was wondering, what do you do, Grace, when you face with a situation where, say, you know, certain people from the community, and I'll just name her, like a Lakshmi Narayan Tripathi, you know, gets a certain amount of government recognition and a certain power by accepting the government's bill and sort of championing it. And then someone like you have to face the choice of, do I want to oppose it from outside? Or do I want a seat at the table with a, like somebody like a Lakshmi and raise my issues there, which works better? Uh, I'm always with the people side and the people demand I should be raised for my community voice. So the people like uh, that so-called caste privilege and the class privilege persons are occupying all the spaces. So that's all the people know. So people from the Dalit and Adivasi background, we don't get the privilege to access those kind of uh, uh, platform. So how it's going to be a safe and how it's going to be a equality and how it's going to be, you know, to work with the government sectors. So the bureaucracy people should be aware about, you know, they should be intersectional thought to, uh, they should have. Otherwise, it's like, you know, going to be a, a group of people will get the beneficiary and group of people who are having caste and class privilege, they only access that uh, the, those kind of platform. But people like us, yeah, you know, we are always like, uh, you know, demanding. But I'm so happy with the, to raise the voice from the people. When you talk about intersectionality, Grace, can you share a little bit, you know, maybe anecdotes about what it was like for you navigating school and college as a both Dalit and a transgender person? So the school education is like a... As all the people know, when I confirm my gender identity, immediately my school principal, they stopped my education and they came up with a lot of points like, uh, I don't talk with anybody and I should come to school early and I should leave from the school uh, before the, all the students leave and I couldn't talk with anybody. I couldn't enter into the classroom. I should be sat under the tree in front of the uh, principal robe. He will remove his slipper. So you had to sit where the principal removed his slippers. And then you were literally sitting outside and listening to the classroom. Yes. This is like totally eclavia. Yeah, of course. Of course. That's happened to me. And that's like a 14, 15 year old kid who doesn't know about anything. But this society threw all this kind of transfer beak and the caste based oppression against me. You know, I know the value of the education. 
because I was struggled to get that education space and uh, school education. It's not a safe space for all the trans kids. And uh, till now, a lot of trans kids are facing those kind of situations. But people like us, we are creating a safe space for our future generation. And that should be for all, not only particular caste and class privileged people. So for me, this all kind of atrocities happened. So that time I decided before I drop out my education, school education, and I joined the diploma. I mean, after that, I plan to continue my education. So I strongly decide education is more important for our community, but that should be a safe and secure environment we should be create. Did you have any support at home? <laughs> my family members recently, I mean, a few years before only they accepted me. But even though like uh, they are from the rural area background, they don't have a proper education thing and they don't know how to handle trans persons. And now they are aware about the trans persons and our child is like, you know, doing this all kind of work. But slowly that they accepted me, but not fully. But when you were in school and having all these issues with school, what did they say? No, they don't know about the trans, uh, what is trans identity and why my child is having this kind of uh, problem and uh, why my child is doing this, all the things. So they put me in the mental asylum when I try to explain my gender identity to my family members. And uh, I was in the mental asylum three months. So I tried to convince my family members, but they don't even know about that. But my mother was very upset because I dropped out my education because see, from the childhood onwards, she believe, I know education is more important for our community and people like us, you know, you should be get education, whatever the problem has happened. So I broke those things when I was in the kid. But after that, I continue my education. So that's why, you know, slowly she's like trying to accept me. And when you were in the psychiatric institute, um, were they aware of things like gender dysphoria or issues like that? No, they don't even aware about transgender persons, single word. They treat me very, very badly. And they gave a lot of psychiatric treatment against me. They put a lot of injection on my body. And uh, still I'm having those kind of traumatic situation in the mental asylum. A, a child who was in the you know uh, dark room and every day putting the injection on three times and sleeping, and so the injection, and that's like super kind of atrocity they did against me. How did you get up? It's like I did lie. I, uh, I uh, told it to the psychiatrist, hey, now I feel like a boy, and now I feel okay, and I'm like, I'm cured. So those kind of uh, drama I did, and he believed that, and he discharged me. And when I discharged from the hospital, the next day, immediately, I decided to left from my home. So I left from my home. So I was joined to the trans community and I, I continue my education. Yes. And actually, I read the comic that was done about you. And so I know some of this. <laughs> but uh, so you joined the trans community and, uh, you know, as you said, the, the focus on begging and sex work and all of that. How did they regard your interest in education? You know, you wanted to be an engineer. That's not something the trans community is associated with. When I was in the mental asylum, I got a chance to read Baba Sagi Pambekar writings, Waiting for Visa. So that is changes my life. And, you know, because after that only I realized why this all the atrocity and uh, discrimination has happened against me. And, uh, you know, I should clear about myself. So I got a clear ideology. I should focusing on my education and I should create a, a platform for my trans community because the society, you know, they are thinking... These people are always doing baking and sex work. So I should be break those kind of uh, stereotypes. So that's why I strongly decide I want to continue my education. So I told it to my trans mother and she immediately said, yes, you should be continue your study and I will support. So she was supported me a lot. And we made an Alva suite mm -hmm. of southern part of Tamil Nadu. So we did the Alva business and I continue my education. I finished my diploma. So I got 95 percentage in my diploma. And after that, I got a placement opportunity in Chennai. And I moved to Chennai. And you know, I was working in the workspace. And the workspace, it's not safe space. So from that, I want to create a, a 
safe environment for the my community so one of your first big activist steps was to fight for the right to go to college because you had cracked this exam and uh, about getting placement in a college but uh, you know what was the challenge of getting into engineering college and then once you got in were they equipped to have someone like you there when i uh, try to apply the engineering college before that we got a rti reply it says uh, trans people doesn't have a right to get a professional course so i decided why don't we get a rights to to get a pro- professional course so we are also tax payer of in this country we also have all the rights to to enter into the education institution so that's why we filed the petition in the madras high court and through that i got the opportunity the state government allow me to get the engineering college and for that i got a private engineering college not a government engineering college even though i got 95 percentage and i am the first trans person it was happened on 2014 after an alsa judgment immediately within few months i try to explain hey i'm the first trans person you should be create a platform for all the people and they didn't even give any support from the government when i enter into the college and i got super happy because uh, i thought uh, my community will get a all the benefit later but when we get those all the benefit now so that's giving a lot of uh, uh, you know oh wow that's nice so we got that opportunity but every day i used to travel four and a half hours my college because it was that far away yeah so they asked me to pay the hostel fee uh, so the college fees and the examination fees and i went to approach the our university dean and they were like they don't even may not meet me so i said i'm the first trans person but when you give the opportunity for me lot of people like me they will get a opportunity to get the education rights and they said you should give the request letter so i gave the request letter so september 29 i got the that's my birthday so i got the letter from the anna university my college principal said hey you got the letter so i went to open the letter and i was shocked it was super surprise it says we are giving all the examination fees is free and uh, not only you the people like you you know in the future all the trans people have the rights to you know, fees free of examination so that was like super surprise from me best birthday present yeah but how did other students and teachers react to having their first trans classmate i would assume oh, for me it's like uh, all the students from the rural area so you know before i enter into the college and they were like uh, they read all the newspaper media and they did lot of research oh okay grace bano was a uh, i mean say do i see a fighter and she's a uh, fighting for her community so those all this and uh, all the people are trans friendly and uh, very few staffs are like a uh, transphobic persons but i don't care about that but for my principal and my college dean they are all very good and they supported me a lot only one satisfaction is like uh, those college uh, doesn't have a i mean like uh, the women they don't participate more in the sports so when i was studied i was like uh, break those all the rules and we created the women sports team and we were like encouraging all the girls to participate the sports team and for the first time all the all our girls team went to participate in the state level competitions so those kind of <laughs> changes we i created and that's it <laughs> and this is not just um, in college but again in the workspace and things some things that have become such a huge impact an election issue in a place like america bathrooms and the safety of a trans person in a bathroom how did you have to deal with these so for me it's like a toilet it's not an issue because of all the trans people are you know using their own waste to the toilets and particularly in the corporate sectors uh, 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 all the people are demanding the gender neutral washroom yes of course we need a gender neutral washroom in the all the spaces but how do we implement in the school level and i know for me it's like i am facing this all kind of uh, atrocity and the violence in the schools when i was in the by school when i was studied and those all the people are like you know every day morning 7:30 i should be you know use the bathroom in my home and the whole day i won't drink a water and uh, you know once we finish the tuition school and once we reach the home 
like it's almost 8 p.m. And so that's like the long hours we were like holding that will give a lot of health issues and the mental issues. So that situation I face and maybe a lot of trans students also facing those kind of situations. So maybe thus children should be have a gender neutral washrooms in their own space. And school education should have the responsibility to create this kind of safe space. And the workspace platform also, it's like, even though when I was working the software company and it's like all gender washroom. So it's like, yeah, so I don't face those uh, discrimination in the washroom. And in my college also, I use the women washrooms, but uh, I didn't face any kind of discriminations. But the Tamil Nadu government initiated a lot of places the public spaces for the separate toilet for the trans people, but accessing those space, no, that is not a safe space. In the sense, the patriarchy and the gender dominant society are throwing a lot of oppression against when I use those kind of separate bathroom. So that is not a safe space for us. But you said even the workspace is not necessarily a safe space for trans people. And you as somebody who is both Dalit and trans, these are both minority identities in that sort of software engineering space. What was that like for you? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's like, uh, obviously, caste is everywhere. For me, you know, all the interview I'm saying, casteism and transphobia is everywhere. So wherever I go in front of me, my caste is there. And these people are right now throwing all the casteist uh, statement against me and all the casteist uh, discrimination against me. For me, it's like uh, when I express my identity, they reduced my salary and you now they took back my residency and you now they put me in the low grade. When I did the surgery, the sex reassignment surgery, my gender affirmation surgery, and they didn't even give a leave. We have a maternity leave for the women, but a trans persons who wants to change their identity, so they don't have a, the leave with the salary. So they didn't give a salary to me. So that's why I raised that demand in the workspace should be, you know, create a safe space and safe environment. And the workspace should be give a medical leave for the trans people, like a maternity leave. You know, recently I was at one of these Pride Month sessions where everybody has to do so many Pride Month, corporate Pride Month sessions these days. And um, the company was talking about the fact that they, in fact, had instituted this policy where they would give leave and assistance for people trying to do gender reassignment. Then I asked them, but how many people have taken advantage of that? And they said zero. But they had the policy there, but it was, I mean, which leads me to wonder now, especially with Pride Month and everything, do you think that a lot of this Pride talk, corporate diversity panels and things is more for sure? Are they, is there actually a difference happening in the corporate sector? Uh, here for me, it's like a pride. When we say pride, pride is a protest. So here it's not happening. Pride is like a celebration and all the people are like using. But who are all participating in those kind of pride? Do you think the rural area LGBT trans persons and the LGBT queer community people are participating in those kind of things? And do you think that pride is a safe space for the people who are, doesn't have a caste privilege, class privilege, and uh, color privilege. So it's everywhere we are facing those, all of the discriminations. So how it's going to be a safe space and how it's going to be, you know, equal for all the people. So it's not for all. They are saying like a diversity and everything, as you said, how many trans persons are getting a job opportunity in the corporate? And that's very, very few. But compare with the LGB people, so they are the, the people are having the caste privilege, class privilege, and the gender privilege, everything. So they occupy those all the spaces. But people like us who are doing sex work and the baking in the ground, still we are doing baking and sex work. Still we are fighting for our education and employment. So I don't know why the corporate people are not focusing on the ground uh, reality for the trans people. And they are like, oh, in the sense, uh, they were saying like a diversity program and everything like celebration and everything, one day festival, food festival, that festival, all the festival they are doing with the trans people. And that's one month celebrations. But what about all other months? All other months, our people are dying. So I will say pride is also have a caste. Pride is also have a color. Pride is also have a privilege. 
pride is also have a class so for yeah. me it's like it's super super difficult to access those kind of spaces i will say like no queer liberation without dalit and adivasi liberation that brings us to this intersectionality point which is that a that dalits can definitely be transphobic and similarly transgender people who are happen to be upper caste can exhibit upper caste privilege and do can you share some examples of how you've experienced both sides okay so for us it's like you know fighting with the i mean being a dalit and adivasi trans persons like you know we have to struggle with within our own community who are all castes and within the lgbt movement and the dalit movement and the women's movement feminist movement and the labor movement and the patriarchal society and the state government like bureaucracy so it's like hierarchy of oppressions we are facing but compare with uh, savarna or upper caste trans persons so they don't face this all kind of oppressions i'm strongly agree they are also facing the oppression and the discriminations but they are different we are different so the facing the discrimination oppression is completely different so that's why we are strongly demanding when we give the horizontal reservation it should be for all the people when we get the horizontal reservation aws trans person also get the job opportunity obc trans also get the job opportunity the bc trans also get get the job opportunity oc trans also get a job opportunity and all the community trans persons should get the, all the rights is any political party receptive to the idea of horizontal reservations for trans people yeah a lot of political parties now talk about the uh, horizontal reservation and uh, we have been uh, advocating those all the demands particularly for the horizontal reservation for the trans community solidarity we are getting from the lot of parties but uh, recently the election manifestos happened uh, few parties only supported the horizontal reservation but that is not also uh, having a clear ideology people also there putting all the trans people in one category that is not equality that is not social justice that is not a constitutional each and every trans persons are having a separate, separate uh, kind of caste background no you fought against all of this you went to court and you're like a success story there's a comic book which tells your story right now but then i was reading that your adopted daughter had to again approach court to be admitted to an all girls high school then to a bachelor's course so it leads to the question what is the way out because it can't be that every trans person who wants to get an education needs to go and knock at the doors of the court not everybody has the resources or the energy or the stamina to do that yes of course i know i completely agree with that you know every time we have to knock the court door for as you said my daughter and the first trans sub inspector of police first trans assistant commissioner and the first trans nursing students and the, each and every individual cases we are going to approach you know knock the court door so this is not a good for all the people it's like you know always we, are, we have to go to the court room and when we create a policy when we create a act when we create a law it should be for all not only the particular caste and class privileged people and every time we have to fight 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 where are our life people like i we are also deserve for the live this society we are also deserve for the love kind all kind of uh, spaces but here it's not happened every day every time the people like a dalit and adivasi background trans persons we are still struggling every day every second we are fighting we are also deserve for the peace where are our peace do dalit activists come and tell you look i mean the dalit issue in this country is so big you know you should focus on that trans rights will have to wait for me it's like all the dalit uh, trans people are like uh, they supported what are the demands i know we are putting on the public space they are always supporting because they are understanding what kind of uh, advocacy we are doing so in the sense we are not even doing the advocating with the government and the policy makers and the law makers we are doing advocacy within our own community also okay see this all the situation we are facing as i said that 152 trans persons who are participated in the government examinations that's not happened you know very easily we did lot of ground work in the you know to educate our community in the sense hey we need to focusing on our education so don't drop out we are here to support you so each and every cases we are handling so we are 
fighting with the bureaucracy we are fighting with the state government we are fighting with the family system and the gender dominant society the patriarchy system everything we are fighting with for to protect those kind of children with the nalsa judgment of the big headline that we had uh, in all the newspapers was the supreme court recognizes third gender in india and i was just curious whether it has in fact become easier to do something like change your aadhar card change your school documents or is all of this easier to go doing going forward but if you're trying to change something that already exists like a school document or something to uh, you know is it difficult or has it become more easy no for getting your document it's super super difficult and particularly the transgender identity card after the nasa judgment whatever the say like uh, for me it's like uh, for getting an uh, a transgender id card it took almost 8 uh, months and that is a basic document based on that only we will get a other card and all other identity card so that's super difficult and we filed the petition in the madras high court after the nasa judgment and uh, you know we said uh, initially they don't have a a right to change their documents even though we apply the supporting document like a gazetted card notification and all other supporting documents it's super super difficult yeah i also apply the transgender id card so it's almost four to five months so still now i didn't get that identity card so just imagine a uh, people who are living in the rural area how they are accessing this kind of internet platform to apply their identity card so that is super super difficult so they should be focusing on the ground people so recently one of the trans the man who is my friend who was uh, try to change his name in their university documents and they were like almost 3 years they are taking still now they don't uh, change his identity uh, in their documents and they were like asking money to change their documents so where do you see the next fight because you said it's always fighting fighting <laughs> what do you think is the most important fight facing transgender people as you go forward so uh, right now the reservation rights so you know we have been struggling and the fighting so many years so that is a when we get the reservation rights that is original liberation for my community and we need to create a safe and secure environment for the gender non conforming children who are studying in the school level and the national child policy should be include the gender non conforming children it's include the special children and the person with disability and all the children but it doesn't include the gender non conforming children so that changes should be come and the parent side you know educating the parents all the state government should be create a separate policy for the trans and intersex people to protect their lives from their own family and the civil society and the gender dominant society yes what kind of a parent are you you have an adopted daughter now what do you fight about i'm like a, i'm friend i'm super friendly with my daughters i'm like i'm strict with my you know only with the education that's it other than that i'm like super friendly they were treat me like a, a friend but finally on a more serious note you said one of the things you keep encouraging people who got into college or school is don't drop out we are there to support you because this is really important to finish this education you're there for these people but you didn't have similar you didn't have a grace banu for you when you were going to school and college and struggling and uh, listening to your story i was wondering what kept you going because it is for a trans kid who feels like nobody understands them it's just very easy to just at some point you fight for a while but at some point you just give up and drop out yeah in the sense uh, i'm like always i know the lot of criticism a lot of discrimination within the community and outside the people also like i uh, you know they are doing lot as you said when i was in the child i don't have a, this kind of grace banu in my life so <laughs> that's why i decided i should be created i know for me it's like nobody don't face what are the situation i face so that all the situation is like very dark so it's like i hate those all the situation what kept you going though yes for me it's like baba sahib ambedkar rama bai ambedkar savitri bai phule and fatima sheikh ayan kali those all the leaders and lot of feminist leaders 
and uh, still uh, the women rights leaders you know they are fighting for the rights so they are like my inspirations yeah so these people are like created a lot of platform but still those all the community people are struggling so we are also you know fight for our community liberation our community uh, rights so definitely one day we should be win so that is my goal <laughs> and you've already won the best third gender award so i'm sure we will do that oh yeah <laughs> so tamil nadu state government they were introduced the uh, uh, first trans uh, i don't agree with the third gender but i openly told to the uh, stage also so a uh, best transgender award uh, uh, they introduced i was shocked they announced me and i'm like oh my god <laughs> it's like by you now because 2012 i was like a uh, protest in front of the the secretariat and now i received the award from the same secretariat inside the secretariat uh, from the our chief minister uh, mk stalin and and i'm like oh wow that's nice and <laughs> yeah we have to be do you know more work and the recognition of the work that is not happening everywhere well that award in the secretariat would not have happened if you had not protested outside the secretariat before so Grace Banu thank you so much for talking to us it was a real pleasure thank you thank you so much uh, for you know for inviting me to this podcast and i'm super happy jai bhim jai savitri jai padiva dalit and transgender activist and author grace banu is the first transgender person to be admitted to engineering college you can check out the comic on her life story on the life of science.com This show was produced by Shashank Bhargav and edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. Thanks for listening. Happy Pride. This is Sandeep Roy on Express Audio.